David, 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 David Banner. Because you, I mean, that was one of the things I was going to say. We got to give people the history behind themselves. And I believe any human being with a rational brain, if you get them the information, put it on the table, I'd say seven times out of ten, they're going to pick the right. right path if the information is there. Yeah, we and we've got to learn. And so that would be the second part. Is so once you find this thing that you love about yourself, it could be physical, it could be a talent, could be just maybe the way you think, the way you are creative and can draw out ideas. Once you find that thing, that's where you stand. And then the next phase is to start connecting your historical story to that thing. So there's a reason why you are the way you are. Find out who mom and dad, grandma, auntie, and that's a for me that's a, a great journey for our for our people to take uh, because of our history. Um, and like Lavelle said, the third point would be is we have to start telling our kids the truth. Right? We live in an ideological society. Right? That is that is the plain truth about the nation, uh, the civilization that we we're a part of, that we were born into, our parents were born into, and. An ideological society has to come to an end because it's not based on reality. It's not based in truth. And so a lot of this, the schism that we see, the friction that we see, we see white supremacy sort of gasping for air and grasping for straws. And we got coups in different places. We got regime change in other places. We got people doing all these different things. And you're trying to figure out well, what what's behind it. Well, you've got the, you're confronting truth with ideology, so it's actually going to be a class, a clash. Our people have been laden and drowned in ideological thought and not reality. So one of the biggest, um, you know, sort of ideological factors that we have and we don't give ourselves a proper education is just knowing our short-term history, right? So even if we start at the end of the enslavement period of Africans in 1865, the next 11 years was the was a reconstruction period, right? But what people don't realize, and I, I don't like when people say this, um, but they're, they're working toward an ideological narrative, is that we were somehow in a bad spot when enslavement ended. That's not historically true. We had all the skills, the opposite is true. right? We had all the skills, and it was actually the black infrastructure that helped maintain this nation, right? President Lincoln made a decision to keep the nation intact, not to free black people. His decision was to keep this nation complete and in one in one piece and not fragmented, you know, through, via the enslavement of black people. And one of the reasons why they created unions was because, because we were the skilled yeah. right. labor. We right, were the labor. Right, 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 right. And we had all the information, all the knowledge. So even if you read, once you read that uh, the Northerners, the aristocrats of the North came into the South, there's a book uh, by Nancy Eisenberg called White Trash. It's a great book because she basically tells the story, the history, 400-year history of white people in America mm-hmm. minus the enslavement period. So we know that, mm-hmm. but we don't know the track of white people in the 400-year history that they have in this country. But she talks about it and has impeccable references about when the aristocrats came from the North, they saw it. They said, it's not black people that need the reparations. It's the poor whites that need help in this country. Mm-hmm. The black people can sustain themselves because what they saw was Literally eight, six years after uh, enslavement ended, you had black neighborhoods, black towns, black cities. It was at the end of Reconstruction, so we're talking about 1877 now, that you had this first attack, right? The implementation uh, of the Jim and Jane Crow system that basically destroyed what we had built, removed all of these black people. The most political power we ever had in this country was in the Reconstruction period. We had black people in all levels of government. Once they got rid of that, implement Jim and Jane Crow, they still didn't destroy us. That next year, once you separate us, we thrive even more. Mm-hmm. So from 1877 to 1900 or 1885, another eight years, we were thriving again. We were not just in this country, but we were thriving all over the world. By 1885, what happened? You had the Berlin Conference in Germany. They decided to cut up. Africa, right, and separate Africa because Africa, Africans left to themselves can build independent states. They can build communities and towns. That happened 1885 to 1900 was another rebuilding period for us in this country. By 1900, you literally had one of the most violent periods against our people started, right? All the way to ninth, another 20-year period, and we're they li- still and they, li- and they lie about the numbers of deaths and the people uh, right, that yeah. they killed. Right, yeah. right. And, but by 1920, we had still survived that. 
and we're here. Our communities were attacked again through the 20s. We were, uh, we were lynched, we were raped, we were segregated. There were all these different things starting to pop up. We had the Negro League starting to pop up. We had uh, our own independent communities again. And then ultimately by the 1950s, what happened? They said, we got to put this to bed once and for all. Right, so we were we were forced into social integration because it undermined and took away our ability to develop our own community. So when now today, when we talk about where we are, right, it's important that kids know we don't have communities now just because we don't want them. They were systematically destroyed, right. and we rebuilt them, destroyed, <clears throat> rebuilt them, destroyed. We did a documentary a few years ago called Wilmington on Fire. Oh, that's incredible! And it was um, you saw it, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We did that documentary on 1898 Wil Wilmington massacres. Right, mm -hmm. Wilmington was a, a thriving black community. Oh, yeah, yes. I, I, I sent you that. Yeah, I sent you yeah, that. Yeah. I sent yeah. you that. I just sent yeah. it to him. A thriving black community. And how in the, in the libraries. Yeah, 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 yeah. From yeah. that section, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That, that blew Wilmington. my mind. Yeah, 1898. Yeah. You were behind that? Yeah, yeah. We produced yeah. that document. Oh, that's the one I sent to you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Say that again, one more time. What's the name? Wilmington on, on fire, and it, it, it basically, but it basically talks about it's a, it's, it's, it's the only coup d'état in American history where the federal government, state government stepped out of the way and allowed militarized militias of white people to go in and literally take the land and kill black people and drive them out of Wilmington, And North then Carolina. turn around and lie about the narrative, like uh, actually right. lie about what happened. But see, this oh, is why right. it's also important that our young people know, like Tulsa was not an exclusive event. It was, a, it was a, just another one in the long line of them undermining our communities all over the country. Right. There were there were if you look at the period, literally, if you just mark out, like I said, you got 1885, which was uh, the Berlin Conference, go to 1886 to 1900. You're talking about the, 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 the physical implementation of this system against us. And it literally undermined community after community after community. And it marked, again, a very dark period for us in this country. Um, but again, it's important that we have this truth on the table so our young people are looking at it saying, oh, well, that's why we're, we're in this You know situation. what you got me thinking now? Like, if you, I, I really believe that once the most high put things on my mind, mm -hmm. I start seeing it. And like in every city, if we would be still, like when I'm walking down yep. the street yes. in New Orleans, I've done it. you would see the monument. Like the right monument and, and, and the history is everywhere. right there. Because you everywhere. made me right think, I'm thinking right around that same time is when they had that, um, when, 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 in Memphis. Yep, there's right? one in Memphis. It's right around. 1901 or the same. It's all of them. We if can connect. Just, that would all be dope. Them. Just go through them. And we just connect all. You can all. just go through yeah. them. Yeah. Every, you can go through them. If you go through the Southern Belt, everyone, you can, I'm telling you, it's just, and it's the year, you, you'll find it in, the, in, in history. It's going to be after 1885, before 1920. And, and, and it's funny because, you know, one of the, one of, one of the greatest things that I learned is people who have been through a level of, like the level of violence that Africans have yeah. been through, that it literally affects us at a cellular level. Absolutely. And I talked about on my last album, The God Box, I talked about in Portland, right outside of Portland, they had a place called Vanport. And in Oregon, period, there was something that's called lash laws, that every black person in Oregon had to be whipped once a year so that they can stay in Oregon. But the, nor the narrative that people give is that Oregon is a real cool state and one of the highest level of, of, of organized militias are also in that state. Oregon was originally supposed to be an all-white state. Yeah. That was, that was the purpose a, of Oregon. That was, was one of the first state. laws they implemented. Yeah. Was black people weren't, weren't yeah. allowed to be in Oregon. Bro, that's something we got to talk about. Yeah. Like, we should probably do that, bro. Like, I, yeah. I would like to do that where we can connect well, all of these different things because I say this all the time. They always say black people should pull themselves up by their bootstraps. And what I usually say, Sally, every time we do it, you, you burn cut us them down. off. Right? Yeah. You burn us down. They burn us the fuck right. down. You burn it down. Right. I know you had a, a question that you wanted to ask, Sally. No, nah, I wanted to ask Lavelle. Yep. So, like, <clears throat> we be talking about, I always had this discussion, and me and him talk about it a lot, as far as like guys going to HBCUs and playing ball and stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, because I always think like that's real feasible, like for basketball, but for football, that's a whole different story. Right. Like, it's a lot more go into it. Like, y'all can ball, y'all can ball. Y'all get y'all, right. like, your school, y'all y'all stay, y'all. I see y'all uniforms nice, y'all got y'all shoes, you roll the ball out on the court. Right. It's like, let's go time. Let's do it. Football, that's a whole lot of other small stuff that don't go, that's totally different. Like, right. I done seen my boy, my best friend that didn't play for Morehouse, 
and I done seen my other partners that didn't play for Ohio State, West Virginia, right? And just they weight room alone and right. what they eating that that you have to yeah. eat a certain way and train a certain way in the off season for football is different versus basketball. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, just just to, that's a great question. Just the mere fact that you bought up that and and you were able to do the, the pluses and the deltas of a predominantly white institution in the black college means even more on why she would attend black colleges, right? Because those other schools, they got everything that they got off the backs of the black athlete. You follow what I'm saying? And all it would, man, I'm telling you, all it would take is just... How many would it take? Like For basketball, all it takes is is one. That's what, yeah, so that's what I'm saying, but that's a one different, one. but that's my point, though. Football. Like, football, that's a long, you, it's a lot of cats going to take some yeah, L's some, in the process And here's that, the though. thing, somebody, and this is what, I love this generation because they're, they're so, they're just not scared of anything, right? They have so much knowledge. But if it was one thing I would want this generation to do is sacrifice more, right? The one thing our ancestors did, they sacrificed. So, like, in 1947, that was interracial, uh, Jackie Robinson going into Major League Baseball. Jackie Robinson wasn't the best black baseball player out there, right? You had Cool Papa Bell, you had Satchel Page, you had Josh Gibson and all those people, but he was just given the opportunity, and he was the figurehead that was held up for for change and for sacrifice. And then it was a new wave where everyone else came in. That's what our black kids are going to have to go back and do. But again, we have to educate them and say, look, why are you going and playing this arena where this dude would have spat in your grandfather's face? You follow what I'm saying? So now if he come, then, and I agree with you, basketball, it doesn't take as many resources as football because y'all deep. Y'all might be, what, 65 deep at, yeah. at the time. Yeah, 75. But, 75. No but all it takes is... This, let's say the top 20 athletes in the 2021 class, they get together and say, yo, man, let's go make we history. We're all going. Yeah. Let's yeah. make all history. Of, all yeah. of us are going. Yo, let's, see, let's go make history. To, but this is what I'm trying to say, though. Like, But even with that, we were talking about that. Even if to even start it, you can't just disseminate. You got to pick one school, and everybody will have to go to that school for at least a good 10 years straight for it even make some shift. Because if them 20 players split up and all go to different HBCUs, it's 11 on yeah, 11. It's gonna, You're going to get gonna, your head cracked yeah, It's, it's going to take time. Right, because it took time for us to get into this situation, so it's going to take time to get us out. But what I'm saying is somebody has to be the sacrificial lamb and just say, you know what? Like, for basketball, this is the reality. I'm just speaking the reality. When these kids are one and done, I coached, I, I, I won a gold medal with the Team USA this, uh, this summer, and we've had, it's probably five or six one and done kids on that team. Those kids are going to go to college for four months. They honestly don't even have to go to school second semester, right? So they can just go for four months, make all the bread for the university, and secure their legacy. So if you can do, if you're only going to school for four months, why not go to North Carolina Central? But I'm saying that makes sense in basketball, football. Right. You got to go three years, right? But, Ain't no, it's but, like it's a whole nother. Cycle I got exactly with it, what, what you're saying, saying, but here's what I'm saying. If somebody does it in basketball, then our basketball program helps the football program with the money that we make. Right. And now gotcha. we can fund. But I'm saying, that's what, what I'm saying. Yeah, now we I can change that, that yeah. way. If we make a sweet 16 run, every it's a, we get we get a million dollars just by going to the tournament for the school. Right. right? So just think about the money that's every year that we've we won four MEAC championships at North Carolina Central. Every year, the freshman enrollment is just going through the roof. Right? So that's another like millions of dollars coming in. Each year we advance in a tournament, you get maybe $1.5, million for that. So just to if a black college advanced to a sweet 16, then you probably got six, seven million dollars that now you can fund those training tables. You can go get a, a brand new weight room. Like you ain't working in the red anymore and now the football team can grow. Now somebody can say, yo, let me go run this football program. We do the same thing with the bowl. Just by going to a bowl, they ain't got to win a championship. They ain't got to win a national championship. They can go to the cherry bowl. <laughs> they got all kinds of bowls right here. They can go, just go to the, to the cherry bowl and now they can make money for the university and bring it back and that's how we survive. So Lavelle, what what can we do to get the parents on board? Since I'm sure they have influence on what school these kids are going to. We want to get them to go to HBCUs. That's the thing. We got to reach them in terms of basketball. And Dave can probably attest to this. Basketball has become so cynical, right? Like it's it's the it's the sport that our kids have said. You know what? We're just gonna devote all our time and attention to this. And I was telling Dave this. 
The difference is the same guy that taught me how to shoot a basketball taught me how to throw a football. Same, the same guy taught me how to hit a baseball. He taught me every sport. Nowadays, we got parents and adults that's really utilizing, will try to use this kid to prepare them to go to the NBA so they can reap 5% or 10% off of those kids. And me and Dave see it all the time. You follow what I'm saying? And now you really have parents that's really doing the same thing. Like, their kid probably don't even want to play basketball, but they're spearheading that process because they see the, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. So we got to change their mentality as well. You follow what I'm saying? And, and just make sure they are properly educated too because this is what happens. And I, I mean, I'm just being truthful. It got to dawn on me. And I, I told Dave upstairs, every black athlete that I talk to now, when they're 35 or 40, if you ask them, would you have went back and chose the school that you went to? They say, hell no, I would have went to a black college. Because now they see from a different perspective and they see, and I'm not saying everybody, I'm not trying to bash everybody, but now they see these people really just used me for the two, three, four years that I was here to get what they could out the equation. And once I left and once I was no good to them anymore, they were done with me. Shit, it's sort of like a record label. The difference between that's exactly, record labels, that's record it. labels stop fucking with you as soon as you sign on the dot. Mm-hmm. But I mean, in my opinion, I feel that's like that with anything in fucking life. You only good as your last game. Or that's with anything. The right. moment I start fucking up, you will fire my ass. Right. Keep it real. That, that's right. That's why it's that goes like that with anything. Right. So when that, you done, when your purpose is done, you move on. So that's why you got to maximize the time I, while you there to go forward. But I think what you're talking about is like, because I, exp- I feel this sometimes, it's like the connection is there. So I went to, what was that game? We went to uh, Alabama State. We were down in A&M. Yeah, we went to the, the what's it? The, the, the Turkey Bowl. Or no, the, the festival. They have like a, a year, Yo, every year the, they play. Uh, with Steve Harvey. You yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know you're talking and, about. And that was a, um, that was a, that was a, a kind of a, a different experience for me because I had never been to one of those. You know what I'm saying? Right. And I'm saying, like, when you when you're a part of these predominantly white institutions, you know, like I went to Xavier in Ohio because I wasn't going to college without basketball, right. and that was literally like the biggest scholarship offer I got. I'm gone. It was like 20 black kids on campus. You know, this, the Black Student Association was like this big. So when you talk about homecomings and the the the, the long term connection, I think. Or at the HBCU level, you feel it, right? You go back. I'm yeah, looking at dudes that was, it's yeah, it was. I was, I was like, man, these guys. They were talking about 1962 or something. They graduated from Alabama State, and they all alive. Like that's their thing. Like they gonna stay alive. They cross together. They gonna bring bring this in every single year. So I think he's he's more. It's more that where because we don't have that. It's hard to make that connection because ultimately culture is the ultimate connector. And you mentioned it, like you said, it was a business, and that's what I'm saying. Like, yeah. we have to support our black businesses, our blacks. All of it's tied in together because here's the reality. All these great coaches that you see on this TV or whatever, those kids are creating generational wealth right. for those coaches' grandkids' kids when they could be creating that generational wealth for someone that looked like them and so on and so forth because the reality is none of those coaches, and I always, I mean, I get triggered with this, Right, because I came from middle school where I was really caring about kids. Like I, I just didn't get promoted to college basketball and get caught up in the the sanity and the cynical uh, aspect of it. I really cared about kids. That's my purpose. Is just to use basketball as a metaphor, just to develop these kids into men. But what I'm what I'm ultimately saying is, when the Black Lives Movement was happening, none of those white coaches stood up and said they supported Black Lives Matter. You follow what I'm saying? Like when those kids was getting killed in the middle of the street, none of those coaches said anything publicly about it, right? But black lives ain't matter during that time. But it matters when they running that ball up that sideline. They when they shoot that ball in the side. You follow like, what I'm saying? And nah, that's that's my like only issue with it. What happened at the University of Missouri with their football team when the uh the uh athletic director, I believe he was caught saying some racist uh, mm-hmm. statements, and all the black players walked off. Yeah, he was like, guess what happened? The white players walked off too because they said right. we can't win without them. Right, you know? right, right. But that shows you the power that the black athlete has, regardless of if whether he's in a white school use. or a black school. Right. Right. Them same kids go to North Carolina Central, show up at FAMU. The, the whole course of history has changed. The other, the other thing that the, com- uh, the comedian Goffrey said, he said something that was so dope. He said it's crazy 
these same colleges that these that these black students go to, if they weren't football players or basketball players, they wouldn't even want them want there. Them there right? And they said it's crazy because you push this 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 addiction to black bodies so much. And then wonder why your daughter want to fuck one. Because right. the, the, the daddy, because the daddy is, is, is basically, crazy over it. Right, yeah, it's crazy over it. Right, black right. Man. Yeah. right. Yeah. But that same person, that same person will turn around and be the most racist person in the pub that's in their local town. You know, and everybody else around there uh, ends up being affected by that same type of racism, you know? Right. And so, you got to, and, and, and you've got to have a, Got to have perspective. So one thing I learned, like, <laughs> perspective is the enemy of the athlete. So meaning that the better perspective you have as an athlete, the harder it is for you to actually be an athlete, right? So the ideal athlete is one that is completely toned out or tuned out from the outside world. And they believe that their preparation for the game, their preparation for the sport, playing the game is the most important thing in the world. And... If you remove that, right, so now all of a sudden the athlete starts feeling for homeless people. The athlete starts caring about people dying. The athlete starts caring about sick people. And now it's harder for him to have that clear-cut perspective to just focus on basketball, focus on football, and make that the mountain of his existence. And so what's happened, right, so this is what's happened with Kaepernick. This is what's happened with a few other athletes. Once perspective shifts, it's hard for the athlete didn't say the most important thing in the world right now is basketball. Because once that light is on, it's hard to get it out. It's hard to snuff that light out to say, let me go play, right? You have to figure out a way to manage it. You have to figure out a way to put it in a place where you can say, because I had to do this, man. When So I've been, we've had different incidences of, of gun violence, right? Like there's not a black family. I've wanted to do this for years. Like, if you're a black family, raise your hand if you've been affected by gun violence. Every one of our families has been affected by it. Cousin, brother, somebody we know has been shot, right? That's a, that's literally a part of our DNA. We one person away from yeah, the smoke. No, no matter, even separation. if you're Obama. Right. Like yeah. it, one you person away from the smoke. Dude, away, no doubt. Right. And, that, and, and so that perspective a lot of times, um, the, a book... Uh, $40 million slave by William, William Roden. Roden. He talks about that. Yeah. He calls it the extraction process. So the extraction process is necessary because at a very young age, you start pumping in. You need Nikes, Adidas. You need to leave this community. You need to go over there. You need to get your contract, go a different way because that at a very young age is now extracting you from the community, but it's also getting your mind in that perspective of all I got to worry about is getting this dude, getting this deal, making this league, playing this sport, dedicating everything I do, night, day, sleep, to the cultivation of the sport, cultivation of myself as an athlete, and leaving all those other per perspectives on the periphery. And that's ultimately like the ideal athlete that will, you know, that that they want out here because that athlete is is ultimately going to help further the system, further the established order that's in place. You know, so it's... It's incumbent upon us. Like, one of the things I'm proud of, and I think the last, this generation of players that I was a part of, we were a little bit more outspoken and we were able to handle that balance because we spoke about it. You know, we talked about it. We having those, uh, you know, NBA negotiating meetings. Like, I'm the dude that, you know, it's cool early on, but like when, when shit hit the fan, it's like, yo, D West, you got to come up here, yo. Like, you got to come get in this room with these folks. They tripping. I'm like, all right, I'll be up there and whatever. And we get everything is, you know, we get everything straightened out. And yeah, it's see, like, with, with you, you different. So you already making, like you said, you you already working on starting, like, an alternative. You see what I'm saying? Right, right. But I be wondering, that, like, for all these dudes to go to the league, like, play football, whatever, basketball, whatever it may be, why wouldn't they, like, give, if you saying, like, when they get to a certain point, they're like, damn, I shouldn't have went to one of them predominantly white schools. Why ain't they just giving back when they, instead of giving back to their schools, why ain't they giving back to the black colleges then? We haven't changed perspective. You've right. got to flip that perspective. And a lot of times, by the time they get to that inf that that level of information, that they didn't blew all their money anyway. Right. And a, lot of, a lot of times when they right. figure it out, yeah. <laughs> like That's you said, they're 35. Right. Right. Now, right. now they get broke. 
Yeah. Now they ain't got a pot to piss in right. or when to just throw it out of. And now right. they're like, damn, if I would have went right like here, they would have right. cared about me. Right. You know right. what I'm saying? It would, Because, you know, like black colleges, man, I, I can go to y'all grandmother house or wherever down south and she'll treat me like I was your best friend for life. It's just the, the natural nurturing aspect of it. And that's where most black colleges are in the south anyway. You follow what I'm saying? So that's the element of D, it. D, I wanted to say something, bro, that you sort of freaked me out, man, what you just said. Um, I, I I had a near life, a near death situation about a month ago, and um, as soon as I, I I plowed my way like out of that situation, I literally had to climb myself out of this situation. And um, the first thing I thought about when I came out is like all this work that I do, like bro, I Scott and all of them will tell you it was a time where I would work and I would miss the sun two times because I would work so hard. But like when I came out of that, when I came out of that situation, I realized that I had been so focused. And I actually wrote about this about two years ago. I said I chased my dreams so long and hard that when I finally raised my head, I realized I walked off and left everything else. You know, because um, I, I, I told, I tell people all the time, every person has a hundred percent. And if you spend ninety percent of your time, if you notice a lot of these cats who are great at what they do, they usually can't fight. They usually are terrible fathers. Um, they're even worse friends. And the reason is because you only have 100%. And if you spend 90% on one thing, then you have to sep- Then you have to spend that, you have to divide that 10% on being everything else. Like, I mean, Lee's tell me all the time, like, dude, you awkward as shit. Like, I am awkward, and I think of shit different because I've always been focused on music it's just that I came from a very violent background, so we had to be able to do the other shit. But, like, th- that's something that I realized, man. Like, when, when, when you die, you don't have the children. And you die and you, you, you don't have the friends. Like, literally, man, I had to go and find each one of my friends in my life because I realized I had been a terrible friend. You know, because I had been focusing so much on something that, and think about this, and I don't mean no disrespect to nothing anybody does in this world, but in the greater scheme of things, rapping don't mean shit in this universe. Bouncing a basketball don't mean shit. Throwing a football, I mean, in the greater scheme of the whole entire universe, not just the earth. And I realized in a lot of ways, we've been distracted in a very cold way. You know, um, I, I gave people I gave people the example of of they would always say that white quarterbacks were more cerebral than than black quarterbacks, and I tell them, well, God made us physical first. So if if dangers come and shit, if you can notice the white quarterbacks that can run, they always run when danger come. It's that we've been so physically blessed in a way that's sort of a distraction because it limits our ability to think first. Because, shit, if I can jump over this motherfucker, I'm going to jump. You know, but I, I just said that, man, because I thought about that in my... After, after that shit had happened or whatever had happened, um, I realized, man, that it's time for us to focus on us. You know, building all of us. One of the reasons why I made this podcast is so that, let's say, if I get 10 million people, well, now Regina... Scott, Sali, they can go off, Corey, they could go off and do their own thing. Our cameraman is one of the dopest artists. He shoots videos. Anybody in here can do. I've learned how to build other people and not just myself, bro. And I appreciate you for saying that, man, because you said it in one sentence. What I had been thinking about and didn't know how to articulate that. I mean, in order to be that great, especially when you're competing at the level, how can, how can a kid not do that? Because you think about Tiger Woods, he I saw a video, bro, where he was putting at like yeah. eight, I think it was eight <laughs> months. Yeah, he, How can you compete against that if you don't give that type of focus, though? Right, right. That's the challenge. Um, you know, that may not I, be no answer. And that's what I'm saying. It may not be an answer to it. But that's the challenge. You know, we um I think that's why you have certain guys that go like, you know, we have guys where we're like, okay, is he gonna take that next step? Mm-hmm. And and they don't, right? You like, is he really gonna like, I guess even with a guy like um, like with Colin Kaepernick, right, like it got to a point where Cap, it was weighing on him, it was weighing on him, it was weighing on him, and he could no longer, even if it was for a game, 
put the perspective of his worldview to the side to play football, like you just said, because ultimately, if that, it's it's really hard to be a pro, a pro athlete if you can't at some moment. Like when I was when we went back to New Orleans, that was like the hardest one of the hardest times of my life is because we literally practiced. Like I had to practice to play in my mind. I had to say we're doing something that's helping people. Like that, it, and it was like a every day, and even the organization had to adopt it because it was that hard to go back to New Orleans knowing that people just drowned. The city is completely turned upside down from what it was. Like I was com- in the waters. Completely. Though. I was in the waters. Right. I went, like, that was my first depression. Right. I've seen things that, uh, yeah, that it, even the news couldn't get to. Right. You know what right, I'm saying? Right. And the crazy thing I always tell people, because people didn't know this, um, Katrina actually didn't hit New, New Orleans. Orleans, right? It got the residual effect, the and if if some people would have spent that that eight that full eighteen million right. um, rebuilding them levees, levees instead right. of patching them up, like I was privy to a whole lot of information that people didn't know. So like I was down there in Mississippi right. where it actually hit, where actually like the um, boat that the casino was on was down the street. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Um, but 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 my question to you, bro, is like, what's 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 the next level? Like, if if there was a perfect world for both of you all that 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 we can have for our people as it pertains to especially sports, what would that look like to you? I I'll put it to you like this. I'll go first. Um, so I got a ten year old son who's a hooper and a thirteen year old daughter. She's gonna be his agent. Like right. I I'm like literally we in the living room. I'm like yo. You are going to represent your brother. There's no reason why you can't do this. She actually watches more sports than he does. Like, she's a bigger, but she doesn't want to play. So I said, well, how can we translate this passion you have for sports, this understanding that you're gaining? Because you sit down with her, and she like, you know, she's talking you through certain stuff. And I'm like, well, how about we do this? How about you work on becoming your brother's representation? You handle the, the stuff out front for him. And she looked at me, really? I said, yeah, really. So when you talk about a perfect world, it's ultimately for me, it's us controlling our own talent. We control our talent. We, you know, our talent, meaning our young people look to themselves, look to people who look like them as the first source or outlet for information, for direction. And after that, you know, because we are such a diverse people, we have these wild imaginations. There's no, there's no telling what direction we can go. But I think it starts with the, you know, controlling that talent, understanding that we can turn to ourselves first for answers, for guidance, and for key, you know, for key points to push forward in, in our lives. <laughs> that boy crazy. For, for, <laughs> for me, man, for, for me, it's, it's really simple, man, because now... Uh, hold on one second, LaValle, yeah. just to loosen up the room a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you looking at me, babe? That's <laughs> crazy, man. I mean, <laughs> spoil, spoil, spoil. I do it again Regina, if you don't. How you doing with this? She hates that <laughs> shit. Regina, <laughs> Regina, how you deal with this all day? Well, we Pray. we make it up though. We treat it good. We got to now. Yeah. That's it. But but for me, man, just to just to um, piggyback off what what David said, and, and it's something you said earlier, bro. Um, and you've taught me a lot of this. And I was just telling Regina this upstairs, man. Uh, and I'll share this story with y'all. We have to understand that we're more than our athletic ability. We're more than our talent. You know, your talent is your talent, but I think it's super important to find your purpose in life. And once you find your purpose in life, then you can move accordingly. My grandmother told me when I was young, two most important days of your life, day you were born, day you figure out why. You know what I'm saying? And something happened in my life on April 1st, 1984. Our phone was ringing. I answered the phone. I was a 10-year-old kid. It's my, my mother's best friend upstairs. She said, Puffy, put uh, your mom on the phone. I put my mom on the phone. She tells my mom Marvin Gaye is dead, right? And it just, that day was just like, it felt like the Kobe situation for me as a kid. So I had to run and tell my grandma that Marvin Gaye was dead. They're going to, they're doing a, a, a moment of silence 
on ABC News or something. And as they go going to break, she said, you see his birthday? And I ain't going to never forget it. It was April 2nd, 1939. She said, his birthday don't matter. His death date don't matter. The only thing that matters is that dash because that's his legacy. That's how people will remember him. You follow what I'm saying? So I've always tried to live by that and know, like, I'm here on this earth not to just win championships because when it's all dead and gone... At my funeral, they're not going to talk about me at championships. You know what I'm saying? And my grandmother told me, she said, if people remember you as a basketball player, you've done a poor job of living. You know what I'm saying? And the thing about Kobe Bryant that I think we're, that, that hit us all, if we're being completely honest, we thought he was some, it's certain people that you just meet in life that you just think is invincible to the bullshit that's going on. Right, right, right. We thought he was one of them. We thought Kobe would be 120 years old, mm -hmm. handing out NBA trophies like Bill Russell, having Mamba's academies and teaching everybody the Mamba mentality across the world and so on and so forth. It was probably like that with Pac or whatever, but the thing with Kobe, Kobe made, our, made us for, face our own mortality. You know what I'm saying? And reevaluate our life and understand like what you just said. Basketball at the end of the day, that don't mean shit. Rapping don't mean shit. It's like, what are you doing now to affect and have your life bless other people, man? And we got to create that general generational wealth, and we got to create that legacy for everybody, man. So that's what I would do and start with young kids by telling them that. Okay. So in closing... Is there anything that y'all want to say to the world? Anything you want to push? Uh, is there any websites? Anything that people can know about you? I need to know about everything that we can go buy. The right. Especially, no, I'm serious. Yeah. Especially the um, the documentaries and stuff. Because yeah. a lot of times people don't know. Um, yeah. I'm stop this for a second. One of my homeboys told me, he said, David Banner, you, you too humble. I said, what do you mean by that? He said, bro, if people knew about, like, I was looking this morning, one of my homeboys sent that remix of the Maroon 5 remix that I did. I forgot about that shit. Like, my dad, because I'm a Southerner, always told me, like, you don't talk about what you do. That's left up to other people to do. But now that we're in such a narcissistic world and, 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 and people are pushing that, man, it's important for people to know what we did. Because if we don't talk about it now, we compete against each other so much. Lee actually made me remember this. Lee said, you know, somebody had came in, into his room and he had a, a David Banner poster up on the wall. And they was like, man, what the fuck you got that poster up for? He said, because that's my, that's my guy. Right, man. He's like, I'm proud of my homeboy. And he's like, you remember when we were growing up? We you all had, had LL on right, the wall. Right, 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 right. We had, you know, right. ice. And I never thought about that, bro. Because sometimes even me, because I know better, <laughs> sometimes it's hard for us to give it up to other people because we look at them. And it's funny. I told Tip this. Me and T.I. just did uh, the David Banner podcast and expeditiously together for the prison situation in Mississippi. And Tip was surprised because I told him. I was like, bro, you're not my competition. Like, bro, we're not competition. We are a family. We are a tribe. So it's important for people to know what we're doing, tell them what we're selling, because we are one of the places where our constituency supports. So let us know what you're doing. Let us know what's important to you, bro. And shit, bro, we got a book list yeah, yeah. just for this motherfucking show. You know what I'm saying? And let's hear the name of that league again. Oh, yeah. Uh, the PC League.com. You can check that out. Uh, I, again, I don't have a lot to self promote. I would just say, you know, continue to pour into young people. Um, you know, they're the future. I know that's cliche, but. It's better to it's better to, to 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 build a child than to than to repair a broken man. That's the that's an, Africa, you, that's an African oh, African proverb, man. It's so it's one of the ones that I, I live by. But uh, hold on, the difference between him and you, you hate grown ups. Lee don't like Lee always be like, the motherfuckers should know better. We right, should whoop right, right, their right, ass. Like <laughs> you know, Lee, Lee loves kids so <laughs> fucking much. There but I always go. tell Lee, like, bro, right a lot of times it's because they just were not taught better. Yeah. You know, and then in other cases, I do agree with them. But yeah. <laughs> Lee don't the, give a shit about Pouring the young people, man. Just pouring the young people. Yeah. And what's the name of the documentary? Oh, and Wilmington on Fire. Well, check it out. Yeah, I would I would encourage it's online. Um, just look it up. It's a it's a very small piece of history that folks don't know about. We got more coming. They'll continue to shoot docs and um, education. Uh, got a book on the way too, Minding My Own. That'll be a banger. Um, my own book. Any right websites? Here. Uh no websites. What we doing in the future? How how we gonna make some money together, bro? As well as teach our people. 
I don't know, bro. We'll talk about, we'll it. Talk about yeah. it. Oh, we're going to figure, figure it out. Yeah, yeah, let's let's figure it's going to be flies, bro. Yeah, let's figure it out. We should put my face on the cover. Let's stop the music real quick. This is very important. This dude here, man. Yes. Just so you know. I see him. I see yeah. him, boy. Funny story. We get I had those kids Ewan's. In those HBC Ewan's because <laughs> they were they were one of the few brands that was making like size seventeens that could like in the store. You didn't have to like special order and stuff like that. Right. So that was like literally one of my first pair of sneakers. Do like, we have a size seventeen? We gonna get one made. Let's get one made. We we'll have to get. We we'll have to get. I think they said the biggest one they had was a sixteen. <laughs> nah, we don't, but they'll make it for us. I had a, right. I had a, yeah, I had a, yeah. a big pair of you ones, man. It's a yeah. big. <laughs> <laughs> so, bro, What's like, up? are you ready, man? I stay like, ready, bro. Right, well, this shit. Uh, okay. What you got to say? Okay. Hold on, wait, wait, wait. Okay. No, we can't use that. You one. can't that, use that. Yeah, that's you that. my guy, but you can't use that one. Oh wow. Cold weather. Territorial. As you always. Hold on. Who did you stay down the uh how did you stay down the hall from? New edition. Okay. Oh, I know. Oh, oh, no. oh, so oh, wait, 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 stay right there. Hold on, stay right there. You like that. I'm huh? with that. Hold on, stay right there. There she goes. Stay right there. All right. There she go. You Put it on. You don't have to do this, bro. Put it on. Can we get some of them all? Man, come on. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Mm. Idiot, idiot. <laughs> this is crazy, man. Nah, he, he, try, he trying to do the new edition stuff. Yeah. The new edition stuff. That ain't it. He be out there. Yeah. Yeah. He gonna need to get the right song for this stuff. Go, Val. Oh. There oh. it is. Hey. That's that Mr. Hey. Park bounce hey. right there. Hey. Brooke hey. Payne, what hey. up? Hold on. We, we ain't gonna have you to do that. Only because Scott say we do we do too much motherfucking dancing. Oh, no so, doubt. Like, <laughs> too much. Hey, let's cleanse. Let's cleanse it out. Right crackers. Shout out New Edition. <laughs> Nasty ass crackers. Out, out I own my shit so I can say fuck you motherfucking crackers. Fuck. Fuck. What's the other guy we gonna say fuck? Fuck. We're going that. Fuck. Because he didn't really want to free us. And that motherfucker was one third black. Fuck all the whites you had in your blood, you fucking crackers. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you something really funny. <laughs> so, so when he was doing, when he was coaching uh, you with USA team, yep. I told him, bro, you can't come on my show. <laughs> 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 it's <an USA>. after. <laughs> yeah, like, you get done because uh, uh, we, we'll fuck up all your hopes and aspirations. How do you know which button to push, man? I'll be, I've been doing this you shit already? so long. Uh, okay. But you know which one I know where exactly. Which watch one is this. The... Watch this. Hold on. Hold on. Watch this. I'm gonna close my eyes. Watch this. Uh, oh. I know what that button is. Regina. <laughs> Regina. I'm so done with that button. Regina. <laughs> hey, oh, Scott, God. say something that Regina would like. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, that's my girl. I love the Lord. Regina is our staff Christian because none of us are Christian. All right. It's okay. But she balances it out just in case. You need to balance. Yeah. Absolutely need to balance. Okay. Lavelle, I do want to punch right. my face. Go ahead. <laughs> Look, man, um, support North Carolina Central Basketball. Um, time for the MEAC. Yeah, time for the MEAC, man. We need the love and support, man. Uh, follow us on Twitter and uh, Instagram, all of the social media pages. Uh, my foundation, man, very, very big. Every year, the first week of October, I have this event where I honor 150 single moms. Single mother yeah. salute. We had an incredible speaker two years ago. He had the sexiest motherfucking speaker of all time. <laughs> 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 If he do say so himself, you know what I'm saying. And he does. And then he all, does. The time, all the time. All the time. But no, I got a I got a uh, TV show that I'm I created and, and co-produced, man. Um, called the Connect. You know what I'm saying. So I, I had to get my Tyler Perry on the first episode, and basically it's kind of like a throwback. You know, uh, very similar to what we grew up on with Teen Summit, just giving teens a platform to. Right. You know, speak in a non-judgmental way and address some of these current issues going out here, man. So, Jeez, some of you used to be dope. So that needed. used to be dope, That's right? So, yeah. so needed. Yeah. So I'm bringing that back, man. My first guest was this guy too. I, I got him for everything, man. Him and Ninth Wonder. Shout out to Ninth Wonder. Um, you know, for coming through and you know being such a huge influence and having such an impact on these kids, man. And yeah, uh, I'm, I'm in the process of, of building a steam center, man. 
Um, what we talked about, you know, every time people meet us is probably they want to do what we do, but we've been blessed enough to just do the 1%. So we got to focus on the 99%, man. So we're going to focus on the science, technology, and engineering, arts, math, and music to it, man. So that's going to be coming real soon. So I uh, appreciate you having me down. And, and turn the music off. Let me say let me say this to everyone out there, man, because he, he don't say this enough, man, but we're talking about friendships and uh, being genuine and, and, and humble. Bruh, I know I say this all the time, but, man, I got to thank you for being one of the best friends a man could have on earth, man, because y'all truly don't understand the conversations and the perspective that he's changed my mind to, man. And, like, anything I'm going through, whether it's, you know, with, with a struggle with mental health or just in a dark place at that time, man, he's always there providing insight and, and, and not only insight but just resolution, man. And oftentimes as black men, we don't get a chance to talk about things that's really holding us down and boggling us down. We tend to bottle those emotions, man. But I want to say thank you, bro. I love Welcome, you, man, man, for everything that you've done for me, all right? Yeah. My here, man. Bro. All the you time, know man. You know. And that's been a couple times um, where we almost had to beat the shit out of a couple motherfuckers. And, cause, <laughs> you can't tell that about LaVelle. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm at sorry. Risk. I remember one time motherfucker was talking shit. And his, oh, and his wife had to stop him. Hey, man. <laughs> he was hey. Like, she was like, hold on, baby. Like, we love David yeah. Banner, but... <laughs> yeah, yeah, it gets, it, gets, it, gets, it gets crazy, man. It gets crazy. I'm, I'm humble pie, though. Humble oh, pie. Man, I appreciate it, man. What, what, what I will say, man, is I also thank you, man, for allowing me to be me. Right. In a lot of cases, man, um, a lot of people back up for me because of my social commentary. And one thing that I was going to say, bro, I know you went through in the league because I can tell by what you said. Um, is that people only call us when it's time to start the revolution. <laughs> yeah. and, and them same people yeah. who... Um, actually, I ain't going to even name his name. You know, he called me, and I was like, dog, why you don't call me when you when you got that Disney money? Why you don't call me when you making movies? Like, you know what I'm saying? I just told a motherfucker, bro, like, the motherfuckers from um, 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 Black Panther and all them motherfuckers, they don't call me shit. I'm on Empire. You know what I'm saying? As much as motherfuckers love the woke David Banner shit, like a pimp is the reason why I'm here. Right. You know what right. I mean? So, like, we got to learn to also have fun and make money with each other and protect each other. Yeah. Like, like yeah. what he said about our friendship, one of the problems, and you know this with me and mm. you know, I was talking to about this. I told you should be careful and be sure that a friendship is what you want with me because, I, you know, I'm, I'm like, I get emotional if a motherfucker come through town. And don't call. Right. Like, that's just grandma right. shit. That's just right. shit that we do. Like, he t he got mad at me because I got uh, uh I got a hotel when I came to North Carolina. Yeah. He's like, bro, you supposed to be staying at my house. Yeah. And I yeah. was like, no oh. doubt. <laughs> the shit I'm, <laughs> shit, I'm coming to do. I, I don't want to do around you. Regina. <laughs> Regina, this boy crazy. <laughs> Hey, bro, steal me. That was one of the crazy bro, things about, this, about, this, day, about this show. God, is, is that I had become so zen-like, bro. It, it was for a minute that I was I was literally floating, bro. I was fasting all the time, reading all the time, but I wasn't relatable anymore. And literally, excuse me, Regina, I hadn't said pussy out loud, like, in almost 10 years. Yeah. So, like, there was a side of me. I wasn't able. My therapist. No, you know I'm telling the yeah, truth. Yeah, you have to you do it. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real thing. I yeah, know exactly like what you're talking about. A, yeah. Like, with like what, what, what one of my... Um, what one of my natural pill, path to kill has taught me. She said, there's no difference between good and bad. She said, it's just perspective. Pussy. She said... <laughs> 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 bro, have you? Go like, ahead. You can say it one time, bro. Who, me? Yeah. I say it all the time, well, but ahead. my wife hates to say pussy. Oh, she shit. shit. Hold on. Oh, we got us for it. Oh, shit. Wait, Scott oh, Parker. She hates oh, it. Oh, no. Scott yeah, like Parker. Her. Oh, She hates shit. that shit. I say oh, it all the time. Oh, that's all right. Oh, you in the right place for that. Oh, hold on. You stay. Don't move now. Hold on. Scott Parker, we got us we for it. Oh, that was the wrong one. I thought I was gonna say pussy. Yeah. Sorry, Regina. Do you want to say something positive before we let him say something? About Lord, the please. It happens though. Sweet. Let us you get, when you get when you get in study, you feel, I know what you're talking about. You yeah. feel like you're climbing, and so you don't want to utter bad words. Yeah. And you like you find yourself like trapped. 
Yeah. Lee so- said the first time I met him, I, I disappointed him because he thought he was going to get the old David Banner. Yeah. And that's when I was super zen. Right, right, And I was like, right. peace, brother. Peace. That shit was boring. Now, now I'm going to say, brother. Yeah, I had, I had teammates. Like, I had a teammate. He didn't talk to me for two months. Lance. Yeah. Lance Stevenson. He said, yo, I... I you be reading. <laughs> you, be, you be talking about weird stuff. I, I don't know what to say. I'm like, yo, nigga, I be chilling. Yeah. I, be, you know what I'm saying? I be kicking it, yeah. but y'all only, you know, it's, it's weird. We, 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 we partake, but it doesn't control our life. Right, I tell people right. that all the time. I'm not perfect, but I am on the road to trying to be. And then I got to, you know, we, because it's funny that this show was never supposed to be what it turned into. But we locked in to something that <laughs> I, I don't know, bro. And it, it I, I haven't, had, <laughs> I haven't had the opportunity to sort of put it back because it feels so fucking good just for a moment. And let me tell you what one of my followers said. They said that you were the person that showed me that you don't have to be perfect to be conscious. Right. Right. You know. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. So going out, brother. You, to the well, I would say, you know, if you're um. You're a young person out there and you're struggling with whether it's your identity as a black person, whether it's your, uh, you know, it's a belief in yourself or a belief in your ability to accomplish, you know, tasks that are in front of you. Um, I would say use what what the past can teach. Um, there's not a single step that we take in our daily life that um, isn't informed by what we learned yesterday. We learned how to brush our teeth yesterday. We learned how to wash our face, prepare ourselves for our daily walk yesterday. Um, So I would say go into the past, go into your history and find, um, you know, your story. And it's the oldest story in the world. It's the grandest story in the world. Um, And there are many, many lessons that you can learn uh, and it allow you to humble yourself. Um, We were talking about religion earlier and Christianity well it would be smart for young black children to know of um, the great pharaoh Akhenaten who turned the world toward monotheism that was a black man he was at times too peaceful um, and he practiced peace he was called the prince of peace Um, and it is in that story that we know that there's a great challenge for us um, in that we are seeking to reclaim a level of greatness that we achieved at one point in our history and you know use what we have and what we've done in the past beyond our lowest period which is more like a blink in the night we're we are the oldest people on the planet we have literary history as old as 60,000 years old use that um, in the same way you would if you were going fishing or you were talking about winning the tournament, right? The people with the most fish, or the people who've won the most tournaments do the most talking. So when it comes to historical perspective and historical understanding, um, we should be proud of where we come from. We should be proud of the journey that we've taken and we shouldn't allow small periods um, at our lowest, you know, really to define us. We've had great women leaders. We've had great female deities. Even to this day, you will not find female deities in any other religion other than African religion and spiritual cultures. Um, And it's an important aspect of our history. And that history should undergird us. It should be, you know, the ground in which we stand um, so that we make calculated steps, you know, next. And those calculated steps that we take um, ultimately pull us into a greater tomorrow than we've experienced to this point. Thank you for supporting the David Banner Podcast.